What's up guys, I am Caleb Giddings, AKA Mr. Revolver, and today we are talking about one of the questions I get asked most, which is, which shooting sport is best for me? And obviously not me, I know what I like, but rather the person asking the question. And over the years, I've had a lot of opinions about this topic, and my opinion has actually changed and gone back and forth based on not just my priorities, but also on the way some of the shooting sports have changed, both rules-wise and culturally. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at that question, and we're going to try to answer it for a broad swath of people. So right off the bat, we need to set some left and right limits for this conversation. And the first is, who is this person that I'm answering this question for? And we are going to broad scope say that this person is someone who is interested in improving their abilities as a defensive firearms practitioner, right? Like someone who's not really interested in going out and winning IDPA or USPSA nationals or being even high B class at area three or something like that, but rather someone who really wants to improve their skill set as it comes to employing their firearm from a defensive mindset, right? And I think that's an important ground rule to establish because it really does color the conversation because what you're going to do, what choices you're going to make are going to be predicated by that starting point. Now, it may very well be that that person who wants to initially improve their skill set as a defensive firearms practitioner is going to start shooting steel challenge and they're going to love it. And then the next thing you know, they're going to have race guns and rim fires and all of this other stuff. But... For the purposes of this conversation, we're going to not assume that, and we're just going to try to isolate one shooting sport that I, in my opinion, think is the best use of time, resources, and provides the rule set that I think is most conducive to enhancing defensive firearms performance. With that in mind, we're also going to establish some limits right away, right? We need to eliminate a bunch of the shooting sports. Like, for example, the most popular shooting sport in terms of like your not traditional, you know, pew or, you know, shooting clays or whatever is cowboy action. We're going to go ahead and eliminate cowboy action. I love cowboy action, but you can go sit down for now. We'll come back to you in a different video. Uh, we're also going to eliminate your you know, PRS, your NRLs, like your precision rifle type events. Uh, those aren't particularly relevant, I think, to someone trying to get good at shooting a handgun for personal protection. We're also going to eliminate one of the sports that I worked really hard to achieve a master ranking in, which is the International Confederation of Revolver Enthusiasts. Not because I actually don't think i is relevant. I think i is just as relevant broadly as USPSA or IDPA, but it's really hard to find i matches. They are few and far between, not a lot of matches. So, knock that one out. We are also going to eliminate, this is probably where we're going to start to get with, into controversial eliminations, three gun i think there's way too much going on in three gun for it to be relevant for someone who is interested in improving their defensive handgunning skills there's also an extremely high bar of entry and there's a lot of gear and it's very expensive and then the last two we're going to eliminate are going to be a dual elimination steel challenge and bianchi cup now why would i eliminate steel challenge and bianchi cup right off the bat despite the fact that i actually think those are the most pure shooting sports they reward primarily shooting actions right like you have to draw the gun but that's the only non-shooting action that you're largely going to do in steel challenge and bianchi cup everything else is going to be a shooting action and then it's going to be first hits it's going to be transitions it's going to be follow-up shots it's going to be long-range shooting and i actually think that if there was a person who could go out and win bianchi cup uh metallic division and then go win steel challenge iron sights division that person would probably be the best pure shooter handgun shooter on planet earth like that would that would be my assertion because that person has mastered the art of just shooting a handgun but the reason we're eliminating those is because defensive handgunning is more than just that. There's a lot of other stuff. There's thinking, there's problem solving, there's, there may be reloading, although probably not, but there may be reloading. There's definitely going to be movement involved. So we want to look at the two sports 
that focus on both of those things, on all of the other non-shooting actions that roll it into a ball. And you got to be good at a lot of stuff because to win at USPSA and to win at IDPA, you have to be good at more than just lining up the sights and pressing the trigger. All right, so now that gets us into the big two, USPSA, the United States Practical Shooting Association, and IDPA, the International Defensive Pistol Association. These are the biggest two action shooting sports in the country, and they are broadly similar, but have a few specific areas of their rules that diverge them from one another, right? So both sports will involve drawing your gun, engaging multiple targets, moving from locations to locations, engaging targets that present non-traditional appearances, whether those are swinging targets, running targets, targets with hard cover, targets with no shoots. You will have to engage targets that are more than just a big 18 by 24 piece of steel or an eight inch piece of steel or a big paper target, right? You have to do more than just shoot the easy ones. Uh, you'll also have to obviously reload. You'll have to do problem solving, whether it's during the stage because your gun malfunctions or before the stage when you're doing your stage plan. Regardless of what it is, both of those sports will reward a number of non-shooting actions that I think are actually beneficial because they teach you, both IDPA and USPSA, teach you to problem solve with a gun in your hand. And I like that. And so my broad, very, very broad answer to this question of what shooting sport should I pick, USPSA or IDP, I'm going to say that it doesn't matter. Whichever one you pick and whichever one you spend your time on will make you better at gun handling, it will make you better at thinking with a gun in your hand, and it will make you a better shooter. So do whichever one is closest and easiest. But that wouldn't be a very fun YouTube video, so we're actually going to pick one. And to do that, we're going to break down the areas where the sports diverge, right? If they're largely the same and that you shoot on the move, you move, you shoot, you shoot multiple targets, you reload, all of that, where are the areas where they diverge? And do those divergences help us pick a sport that's better? So the first big divergence, obviously, is that IDPA will, will require you to wear some sort of garment that conceals your gun for the vast majority of stages. USPSA will not. You can argue back and forth whether or not that's actually an advantage, but I say I will say this, because of recent changes to the rules of IDPA, you can shoot your real-world carry gear with unless you have a ported gun. That's it. If your gun is ported, you can't shoot an IDPA. But if you carry a staccato with a dot and a light, you can shoot that in IDPA and be competitive. You're not going to be getting junk shooting open minor or something like that. And I know USPSA is adding their limited optics division, but it's still provincial. And again, there's no necessary concealment requirement, right? With IDPA, if you carry your gun, you know, inside your waistband at the appendix carry position, and you carry a spare mag right here in, you know, a, a, whatever your holster setup is, you can literally show up to an IDPA match and run that rig. And that, to me is a huge, like, that is a huge plus win score for IDPA over USPSA because you, you can't, all right? It is very, very difficult to show up with just your actual carry gear and be competitive at a USPSA match. And now here's what the USPSA guys are going to say is they're going to say, well, you know, just shoot your carry gear and don't worry about the scores. That's bullcrap. I hear that all the time. Oh, well, just shoot your carry gear and don't worry about the scores. Who doesn't worry about the scores? Everybody worries about the scores. It doesn't matter if it's your first match. You don't want to come last. I know you don't. Don't, don't comment on this video and be like, oh, well, I don't ever care about my score because you're a liar. You do care about your score. We all care about our scores. If we didn't care about the score, we wouldn't be at a competition. Yes, it provides all of these benefits, but you care about your score. And I think that for people, being able to show up and shoot their legitimate real-world carry gear with zero additional stuff added on and being competitive is a big deal. They can, you know, if, you're, if your carry gun is a Glock 17 and you have three mags for it, you can show up to an IDPA match and be competitive with 
just what you have with holsters and two mag pouches. That's it. That's all you need. And I think that is a huge, huge advantage for this defensive handgun practitioner that we're talking about. So that is a big point in the favor of IDPA right there. I think a big point in the favor of USPSA is on average, USPSA will present you with more technical shooting. You know, actually, I don't know if that's true anymore. I've been to a lot of IDPA matches that have had some really technical shooting challenges in them, but we'll give USPSA the credit for this one. On average, a USPSA match that is well put together will present you with more technical shooting challenges than an IDPA match. Because a USPSA match allows shots out at like 50 yards and they don't have quite the rules for like limiting the distance that you can do a headshot on and things like that, you can expect to see more challenging shots at a USPSA match. Uh, I don't... I think that is a point for USPSA because if you are really looking to stretch your skills as a shooter, you will find more difficulty and more challenging shooting in USPSA than you will at IDPA. But we are going to put an asterisk on that because that is very dependent on the club that you shoot at. I've been to plenty of USPSA matches where the stages were some variety of shoot six, run over here, shoot eight, run over here, shoot eight, 10, run over here. And there wasn't a lot of creativity or balance in the stages. But I've been to IDPA matches that were the same thing. So on that one, it really kind of comes down to the culture of the club that you're shooting at and what the match directors and the stage designers want to test and reward. So that one's kind of a wash, but we'll give it to USPSA. So the last thing we want to look at is the scoring systems of each sport and how those incentivize important things, right? So USPSA uses what's called hit factor scoring, which will explain very broadly, but hit factor scoring works down to a formula that is points per second, okay? So each target, each shot you fire is worth a maximum of five points, all right? So if it's a paper target that needs two shots, that's worth a maximum of 10 points. If there's 30 shots on a stage, 30 times five is 150. That stage is worth 150 points. If you run that stage in 10 seconds, you get a hit factor of 15. If someone else, runs that stage in 15 seconds, they get a hit factor of 10. Your hit factor of 15 means you win the stage. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff, like the num the percentage of points that you win on a stage, and that all gets added up to determine who wins the match. That's not important. We just want to focus on individual stage scoring. IDPA is different. It uses what's called time plus scoring, where you take your time, the time it takes you to run through the stage, and then at the end of it, they add in penalties for shots outside of the A zone or the down zero zone, hits on non-threat targets, or things that you did wrong. Both scoring systems, time plus or hit factor, reward the shooter for a balance of speed and accuracy, right? If I'm on a hit factor scored stage and I plod through the stage and it's, you know, a 10 target stage, but it takes me 30 seconds to shoot it, but I shoot all alphas, I'm going to lose to the guy who did that same stage in 15 seconds. So there's a balance of speed and accuracy that is rewarded by those stages. Same obviously with USPSA as we kind of talked about already, but what has happened in the past few years is that the way IDPA scores their stages now rewards accuracy at a much higher level than USPSA does, where USPSA rewards you for shooting a fast Charlie a lot sooner than it would reward you in IDPA. And let me, to break this down, I have to do a little bit of math and explain kind of how these scoring systems work, right? So both targets have what we're just going to call an A zone, and then a C zone, and then a D zone, right? In USPSA, if you're shooting minor power factor, which is 9 millimeter, which is what most people are doing, the A zone is worth 5 points per hit, the C zone is worth 3, and the D zone is worth 1 point, right? In IDPA, the A zone adds no time to your score. The C zone, each shot in the C zone adds a whole second to your score, and a shot in the D zone adds three whole seconds to your score. That is a lot, all right? Now, 
The reason why I say that USPSA will occasionally reward you for a fast Charlie versus uh, IDPA, which will almost never reward you for a fast Charlie, is because of the way the scoring system works. So in USPSA, if I shoot a, if I have a target and I shoot one alpha, I get five points for that, and then I shoot a Charlie, I get three points for that, right? So I've gotten three fifths of the points that I could have gotten for that specific shot. I could have gotten five, but I got three. If I can execute that hit fast enough, basically three-fifths faster than someone who shoots two alphas, we're tied on this stage. To explain, I'll, 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 I'll draw a stage picture for you, right? So let's take a stage that has 10 targets. 10 targets, two shots per target, so that's 20 total shots. 20 total shots times five per shot, it is, five points per shot is a 100 point stage, okay? I shoot all alphas in 10 seconds. So I got 100 points divided by 10 for a hit factor of 10. I am using very round numbers to make this math easier, okay? Now let's say I shoot that exact same stage, but I shoot four Charlies, all right? So I've got four shots that are worth three points instead of five points. So I've lost two, four, six, eight points. So now I have 92 points versus 100 points. If I shoot that same stage in 10 seconds, I end up with a hit factor of 9.2. But if I shoot that same stage in 9.2 seconds, I end up with a hit factor of 10. So I can go 0.8 of a second faster than someone else and have worse accuracy and still be tied with that guy in terms of my overall score. Now we'll look at that same stage, but in IDPA, which you can't actually do in IDPA because the stages are limited to a total of 18 shots, but I digress. We're gonna do it, all right? So I have a 20 shot stage in IDPA and I shoot all alphas in 10 seconds, right? Great, that's my bar, that's where I'm at. Now, if in that same IDPA stage I shoot four Charlies, I haven't lost eight points. What I've done is I've added four whole seconds to my time. I've shot a lot of IDPA matches. I can tell you that four seconds is a really, really, really long time. I have won and lost matches by a margin of much, much less than four seconds. So to give away four seconds on this stage is to functionally give away your match. Uh, it's a huge gulf to overcome and often you won't be able to overcome it versus 0.8 of a second. So if I shoot four Charlies in this fictional stage, I have to make a 0.8 of a second in USPSA. In IDPA, I now have to go find four whole seconds. So, and this math works whether the stage is longer or shorter. It scales up and down. I've run this scenario with a whole bunch of different stages. So what I can say to that is, in the current rules format of the game, the penalty for shooting people outside of that vital area, not people, shooting targets, outside of that vital area is much stricter in IDPA than it is in USPSA. And for me, that's the dividing factor. And I didn't used to feel this way. IDPA didn't always have a one second per crappy hit penalty. It used to be half a second. It was half a second. I would have said go shoot USPSA because I think that the difficulty level is higher and it might make you a better shooter in the long run. I don't actually think that anymore because IDPA matches have gotten a lot better, uh, but I think that the way the penalty structure is set up in IDPA, because it penalizes you so much more harshly for mediocre accuracy, I think that that is the better overall choice for people whose sole focus is defensive handgunning. And it's because you can show up with your everyday carry gear, shoot the match, be competitive, and the primary focus will be on accuracy, right? You have to do it quickly. You have to have a balance of speed and accuracy for sure, but the skew in IDPA is much more towards accuracy than it is in USPSA. And I'm not saying USPSA is like a hose fest where you can run around and shoot Charlies and win. You can't. 
the guys who win these matches are shooting 95% of the available points, if not more. So at the high level, you can't shoot a lot of Charlies and win. And even if you want to be like high B class at area six, you can't shoot a lot of Charlies and do that. But there is definitely, you hit that tipping point in USPSA where you're getting rewarded for a fast Charlie way sooner than you would ever hit it in IDPA. And I don't actually think there is a place in IDPA where dropping that whole entire second is actually the right thing to do. So for me, in my opinion, I think that if you are someone whose sole focus is improving your defensive handgunning skills as a shooter, and you want to pick one shooting sport to invest your time and effort into, your best bet is probably IDPA. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't shoot USPSA or Steel Challenge or Bianchi Cup or any of the shooting sports, because if you shoot any of them, you'll get better at shooting. And that's really the goal here, is getting better at shooting. So I fully expect that you know people who love USPSA are going to come at me in the comments, and that's fine. Um, I've shot USPSA for many, many years, and I still love it as a sport. Uh, I mostly shoot IDPA largely because I primarily shoot six-shot speedloader fed revolvers, and I don't want to get junked in USPSA shooting a gun that's not competitive because I like to look at the scores. Uh, but I think USPSA is great, and I, I do want to say this. I do think USPSA is great. I, I love it, and I made great strides as a shooter when I was shooting primarily USPSA, but again, in this use case that we have constructed, IDPA is probably your best bet. What is very likely and what happens to a lot of people is they shoot IDPA and then they want to shoot more, right? Because you go to an IDPA match, you shoot like 100 rounds, you're like, cool, I need a bigger bite at the Apple. And then you end up shooting USPSA, you spend the money on the gear and all of that. So if that happens, great. If it doesn't and you just shoot IDPA forever, also great. If you guys have any questions, uh, leave them in the comments, uh, like, share, subscribe, do all of those YouTube things. And hopefully this year in 2023, we'll actually be able to get some more content out for you. I'm Caleb Giddings. Thanks for watching.